Steve Yates. Welcome to BCM with Friends. And thank you so much for being with us today. You are a founder member of the BCI. You would have been BCI member number two, but someone got there before you. So you ended up being BCI member number six. You are a fellow of the BCI and a longstanding member of the DRI. And you respect both institutes as part of the Residence Association. You want all like-minded entities to come together. You've been awarded the Hall of Fame by Contingency Planning Magazine in the US. You've been Public Sector Business Country Manager of the Year by the BCI. And you've been awarded Freedom of the City of London for your work in incident management and IT disaster recovery. It's been a long and wonderful journey, I'm sure. So tell us your impressions as you look back on it. Yeah, thanks very much, Deeraj. I mean, it's been, uh, yeah, it has been a journey, really. I mean, I actually wrote a paper back in about 1988 when I worked for British Telecommunications, PLC. And uh, they asked me to set up a team. There was going to be, uh, I'd be the head of re uh, resilience and recovery for British Telecom across the world uh, at that stage, I should say. Um, and the paper was really saying we need to move from this disaster recovery approach to a more of a continuity approach. And they felt that I was giving out the right messages for where they wished to be at that time. And I've got to say, over the years, I've now been involved in it um, since I took that role on board in 89. The reason I'm still in it today is I learn from meeting other people all the time. And that's what I missed during this COVID-19. You know, when I talked about my journey with British Telecom, I was very fortunate at times to be party to setting up the Business Continuity Institute in those days. And I'm actually member number six. I should be member number two, but I couldn't get there on that day. But it was uh, really interesting where we brought on board people to review. And this will come back to Telecom just in a moment, where we brought on board an organisation, The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, uh, who were called Exing, and they were actually there to record and be part of our journey at those initial stages to make sure that people who came on board were able to provide the supporting documentation, how it could yeah. deliver them. And during early days in British Telecom, we went through some significant events uh, covering everything from major fires, uh, communication exchanges, through to uh, terrorist events as well. But I've also worked for other communication companies and been responsible for something like about 20 data centers across Europe as well. Uh, more looking at cloud services in recent times as such. And we're becoming more and more reliant upon these cloud services. And yet, and we still keep forgetting who is responsible for those services. It works across multiple different sectors, but certainly financial services especially. Uh, the regulators are realizing that they need to take control not only of the regulations for the industry itself right across all the firms and different types of business areas banks through to investment firms etc uh, but they also need for them to take control of their destiny using the cloud services as we progress here more and more you know you can't just move the risk you know offload that risk to somebody else, you know, transfer it to that other organization. You know, businesses have still got to be part of the solution there, shouldn't the event occur, and have that level of relationship issues that are necessary to bring the whole thing back together again. When are, when are our events? And they're happening. No matter how big the organizations are, they happen. And you're right, because it's almost like I'm on cloud, I'm good. End of story. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's one of the big challenges, by the way, because having seen bits of the cloud, not all of it, but also its development and also the amount that's going on sea cables through satellites and everything else. You know, we've got to realize these cloud services. I mean, when I first started as an engineer in communications, we always drew a cloud, you know, because we didn't know exactly what was in the middle of it all, you know, where the locations were and how do we pull those pieces together? How do we actually concentrate on making that capability more resilient? Yeah, and I want to keep using that word resilient. You know, things go wrong. And I think we were talking a bit before this, uh, uh, this went forward, you know, our conversation now. But, you know, all the big events that happen, somewhere in there is a partial failure of communication. And we need to understand the criticalities of this and the challenges you will face 
and again trying to understand investment in certain areas again critical national infrastructure areas is critical i think for any significant organization and the impacts across everybody else you know the smes the small medium enterprises especially you know we need to understand all these elements coming together absolutely you said you will be talking a lot about the word resilience so tell us about the resilience association what's the mandate what's the space that it's occupying we've got to understand uh, why i made the decision with other people and i have a formal committee that is currently in place that we need to bring together a central body to work with all other groups whether the institutes universities you know delivering particular uh, subject matter courseware other organizations who are part of the journey which we deal with every day but i originally started back in around about 2006 under a group i set up called business and national government bank and back in 2006, part of my reason for doing this, we were just a, a year on, less than a year on, uh, from when the uh, United Kingdom, London, uh, was given the challenge of delivering the 2012 Olympics. The following day, we had a major terrorist event in London called 77. And it's suddenly the events that happened then and the knowledge of where we need to get to for 2012 as most of my activities were around London itself, I felt we needed to draw together like-minded people, you know, in a trusted group, and we created a trusted group there. And gradually, Bain kept going. We had different groups being set up around the globe. It's over 3,000 LinkedIn members of Bain, you know, where we were discussing things. We were mainly doing stuff in London, but we were trying to draw in expertise around the world certainly in australia sydney and across other parts of the world in new york as well so back in 2019 i was very fortunate to have some really great people around me and we came together and we felt everyone's been talking about resilience now, i'm going to go back a little bit now because i'm going to talk about something which really i guess uh maybe more passionate i helped to fund uh, uh when i was running an, a, another group a three-year study by the University of Liverpool uh, in, in the UK, but they were looking at it on a global basis. And they were specifically looking at business continuity management. And they created a study of resilience and business continuity practice. Because that's how they suddenly saw it. We said, go and look at business continuity. Tell us where we should be going in the future. And this started off in 2007, 2008, 2009 and they produced their study in 2010. Basically, what it was saying is we need to move on from business continuity. All the information they were picking up was really saying people were more concerned about other different elements of it. The structure, the, the, the I guess, the, at the cultural level at the senior management point of view, we would just have to be there. We hadn't really got a direct role. We hadn't been given the support that was necessary. Uh, and they actually said there needs to be a resilience model put together. Now, we actually, this was put forward to a particular institute out there, and it never got picked up, really. 2010 to where we are today, there's not much been happening, except last year when I said we need to create a resilience association whereby we can focus on this thing. We know, uh, and something I'm, I hope we can talk about, is this world of organisation operational resilience. There's a lot about to happen. It's already, some things are already happening. It's being delayed in certain areas because obviously of COVID-19 and events that are happening around the world. We've got other things to focus our attention on, but we need to keep our society joined up and working together. Uh, and I feel that this particular study done by the University of Liverpool, you can find it online. It's absolutely a brilliant thing, really. It looks at some key points from particular organizations that case studies on. And it said then, we need this new type of model. Business operations, whether it be public or private sectors, effective during major events, major, beyond major events. We need to understand people resilience, and we need to understand the operational resilience. And one of the biggest challenges with people resilience at the moment is mental health issues, and I support a lot of mental health charities to work we do in a resilience association, but the people are the ones, and we're finest with COVID-19, 
who are critical to actually the survivability of an organization. You know, the cultural issues which are descending upon them and decision making that comes if, and I hate this term, I prefer major incidents, but if they classify them as crises, so be it, you know. Uh, we need to understand how that structure operates. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we need to understand these things if we want to stay in the world we're part of. That's why, again, I'm going to bring up operational resilience. We've got to somehow see where each uh, part of the world is at at this time. We need to have a, a process which can be used globally rather than locally. We need to have mm -hmm. something which can be transferred to SMEs, you know, small, medium enterprises, so they can understand it. So it's not, it's not magic. It's, you know, you're not Harry Potter or anything else like that. You know, we are magic wand trying to change things. Oh, because the scene management said, you're the guy I've got to speak to. You'll be able to sort this out, which can be utilized at tactical and operational levels in any country itself. And at the same time, we have a way of doing self-assessments on it. Individuals need can do self-assessments. What, what's proportional? What looks good? What should I have? And that's what I like about 22301 at this time. It's an international standard. It's what we would call over here apolitical. It, it doesn't come with a political agenda or anything. Yeah. It's yeah. trying to show people in any supply chain what, what should companies be doing. That's a big ask. And they're going to be doing this. And this is through everything from business continuity, cyber, um, through to crisis management, through to IT disaster recovery. We're looking at a new world for right. business continuity. We need to embrace these areas. We need to draw it together because the ask from organization that just being posted, which are looking for operational resilience uh, managers, you know, and there's a big ask being coming out here. You know, we've seen a, a pre version was we wanted people to do business continuity plus health and safety and security, this right. physical security as well as information. Security. Actually, wow, hang on a moment. Now there's a slight change here in the way they're looking at operational resilience. Here. So some are in there. Whoever's in business continuity has really got to get step up right. and start yeah. moving in some new areas or be part of a very large team. No one individual can really have all the answers to this sort of thing. So where are we going to go? It could be very... Um, good for anyone working in the different areas I've mentioned already. But the key issue for them is to understand where their expertise lies, right? To be expert in all these subject spaces is a big ask for anybody. They need to understand individuals' concern, where they wish to be, and where they can show, uh, I guess, that knowledge and understanding to bring that information together and meet the demands that are being laid down for these operational resilience managers. So therefore, you know, it, I guess if we're looking for a final message here, we're going to be moving from this world of IT disasters. We moved into business continuity. We've seen that the things we were doing in business continuity touch upon loads of different other areas. We probably got a lot more knowledge than anybody else because we were looking at things when doing our risk assessment or our business impact analysis. We were collecting more data than anyone else in that company. We look at all the controls that were going on there. We're actually looking at some of the key elements, the threats to the organization as well, the vulnerabilities. And those are all the words they're saying now in the financial world. You know, the world that we lived in is growing and we're moving next into the operational resilience part, which is where I think people should be looking at what's currently available at this time and the spread of their scope and the knowledge they're currently holding. Fascinating. Something to look forward to. Just touching on something pretty basic, I'm sure there are a bunch of organizations who had not yet put in place huge business country capability, came to COVID-19, figured out how things work, and probably are saying, okay, we survived, but this is not good enough. Now let's do it properly. So to cut a long story short, if someone said, now let me put in place a formal implementation, what would you suggest to them? What's the best way to go about that? I think the key one that any organization do is do a current health check on themselves. Okay. I, I use that a lot now, health checks or a self-assessment. But I, I stay with health check because most organizations have got something. No matter what it was, it might not be using the terminology, terminology we're using. So I've always felt and I've, I've produced these sort of things, health checks for organizations before. 
Uh, and that's quite key. You need to find where you are at this time before you go on that journey to build all the other pieces. Now, if because of COVID-19, they've identified all those things because they had to reach out inside the organization. They may have put some short uh, stops uh, into bridging certain areas which they didn't have during that period of time. Then we just need to get that picture of what they have at this moment and then understand from where they want to be. You know, again, I go back to seeing proportionate. To them, what's proportionate look like? You know, are they going to save the world? Are they going to have a complete, uh, you know, uh, they're going to clone all their staff, have a complete standalone unit where everyone's just waiting for somebody to go, well, it doesn't happen that way. Even governments don't have that. Yeah. So we need to understand what does good look like to them. And they've got to set a target of where they wish to be going. Yeah, we can have all these different checks as we go along that, that journey, you know, to make sure that they have engagement. But it needs, as it says in ISO 22301, we need senior management or top management engagement in the journey and they need to be part of that journey they need to be part of all the different things you're looking at and needs to be a regular interchange going on at the top management world uh without that you don't know where you start you could spend as much money as you like it doesn't mean you've got anything at the end of it that's going to be worthwhile for the organization unless they're part of that journey and they understand it they've got to understand that they've made decision because of other events they know of, which you may not know about, they are prepared to share that with you. And that's the big change we need to have, that trusting uh, arrangement between the top management team and people in and our space so that we can fully understand the pressures they're under and at the same time be able to therefore influence or not influence because we understand that's the wrong journey because they're telling you where the future is going to be we're going to see this a lot now with mergers and acquisitions you know that's going to be part of the journey we're in at the present time uh, and if you're not aware of that sort of thing you're just wasting your time you need to be planning for where you're going right not where you are yeah but we need to get that engagement with our top management and understand their views and their planning assumptions as well. Uh, Steve, thank you so much. Whole range of information I'm trying to digest it all, but lots of good thoughts there. And <laughs> I'm sure people who take a look at this will be enlightened and uh, presumably will want more. We'll keep that for the next stage. Thank you once again. Really appreciate it. And uh, you have a good day. No, that's great. Thank you very much. And thanks for asking me to speak today. My pleasure. And I really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. Thank you.